nobody wants to punish people who commit crimes and it's getting worse and worse crime is getting worse and worse because there seems to be no consequences there are even places in our country today where they say that unless unless a a, a crime for example a a robbery or a theft is worth a certain amount we're not even going to prosecute Our lesson this morning is based on what I suspect is probably one of the most common passages uh, that sermons are based on. And it's that story that we call the parable of the prodigal son, found in the latter half of Luke chapter 15. Now the first thing we have to do is answer the question, what does that word prodigal mean? And I will have to confess to you that for a long, long, long time I didn't really know what it meant. I just thought it meant somebody that was not a faithful Christian. There's a little more to it than that. But let me also admit that I also, for about half of my life, pronounced it incorrectly. I always pronounce it with a C as prodigal instead of prodigal. Anybody else? It's kind of easier to say. So, Prodigal just means, or it actually specifically means someone who spends or uses a large amount of resources like their money, their time or their energy specifically in a wasteful way so that's the story that we have of this of this young man that we call the prodigal son now i mentioned also that this is a parable and you'll remember if you've been in our wednesday night classes that a parable is a is a fictitious story that has a meaningful life lesson, a particularly a, a spiritual lesson or a moral lesson. So this is a parable. It's not a real event, but it's a story that Jesus told that teaches us a spiritual lesson. So I want to <clears throat> I want to read through this passage. And it's a lengthy reading, but I'll try to read quickly through it. <clears throat> but I think that it's important. I know that many of us are quite familiar with this story, but there are probably some who are not, so I want to read through the entire passage, beginning in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking to his apostles. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided him his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he gathered all he had and took took a journey into the far country and there he squandered his property in riotous living and when he had spent everything a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." <clears throat> and he arose and came to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him and his son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and before you i'm no longer worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and bring a ring and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> And bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. <clears throat> Excuse me. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he was received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in and his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never never disobeyed your command. But you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But, 
But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. <clears throat> There's a lot in this story, obviously. And I, I ask that the, that the first part of this chapter be read as our reading today, because I want you to think about something. When we think about this story, <clears throat> typically, you know, we, we call the story the story of the prodigal son. There's probably a heading in your Bible, which is not a part of the original text, by the way, that says the prodigal son. When we study this story, we typically focus on the son that's gone away and wasted his substance with, with all kinds of riotous living, as one version says. <clears throat> but think about, <clears throat> think about the first two stories, the story of the lost sheep and how the shepherd went to great lengths and, and left his other sheep and went to all kinds of dangerous lengths to go and find the sheep that was lost. The focus is on how the shepherd reacted. And in the second story, the story of the lost coin, the woman turned her house upside down looking for that lost coin. The story, the focus is there on how the woman reacted. So I would like for us today to focus not so much on the son, the, the prodigal son, but let's focus on how the father reacted. And I believe, of course, being a parable, teaching a, a, a moral lesson, I believe that we can learn some lessons about God our Father who is represented by the Father in this story by looking at this at the, some aspects of this Father in this story. First of all, look at verse 12 and verse 13. Verse 12 and 13. It says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that has come to me. And he divided his property between him. Not many days later, the, the, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in riotous living. Did the father say, sorry, son, you're too young and stupid. You don't know what you're doing. I'm not doing this. I'm not giving it to you. No, the father gave him what he had. And then when he, a few days later, decided to pack up everything he had and leave home, did the father grab him and lock him in his room? No. He allowed him to go. One of the things that we should recognize as, as Christians and, and as citizens of the world is that God has given us the right to make choices of whether we'll obey him or not, what we call free moral will. He's given us his word. He's given us certain things in there to to uh, follow and obey but he doesn't i've got one bill thanks sorry I just dropped it <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> all right I, I he doesn't force us to obey what he has told us to do joshua 24 verse 15 says uh, and if it is evil for you in your if it, excuse me and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you, do, you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua set this, this challenge down before the Israelites and said, you have got to make a decision whom you're going to serve. God's going to let you serve other gods if that's what you choose to do. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness before you uh, against you today that I have set before you life and death blessing and curse therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live God gives us the rule book to go by but he allows us as free moral agents to make the decision whether we're going to do what he's asked us to do or not but there's always a but I'm sorry, I get a little lost on my slide here. But it's important that we recognize that we must accept the consequences of the choices that we make. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 says, enter by, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those that enter by it are many. It's easy to, 
to, to choose not to serve God. There's all kinds of things we can do, all kinds of uh, things in this life that, that will bring us all kinds of fun and, in, and enjoyment. It's easy to make that choice. But, as the passage says, eventually it leads to destruction, referring to re- eternal destruction primarily here. Galatians 5, 19 and 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. And then it mentions a bunch of works of the flesh, all these sinful things. I'm not going to go through the whole list. But look at the, last, at the last phrase here. It says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have to make a choice of what's more important to us. Uh, I don't have it in the past here, but it was said of Moses that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. By far and away, the vast majority of the people that we see around us are choosing to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, the season meaning while we're on this earth. But, as the passage says here, those who do these sinful things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. We will not be able to spend eternity in a, in a paradise with God if we choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin on this life. One of the biggest problems that we have in our society is that people are not wanting to accept the consequences of the choices that we make. We live in what I call a bailout mentality. And that's true of many aspects, many different aspects of your life. People, when I say people, we could probably all point fingers at ourselves. We get ourselves in all kinds of financial trouble by making bad choices and, and pulling out those little cards in our wallet that say you have all this credit and getting deeper and deeper and deeper in debt and spending the money that we don't really have to get the things that we want in this moment because we want to enjoy the pleasure of whatever that is that we're wanting to buy. And we don't make good choices, and then, and then we want somebody to come along and bail us out from that, whether it be bankruptcy or whether it be somebody helping us out or whether it be turning to government for 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 assistance and don't get me wrong I know that there's plenty of need for the church and us as members and even in some cases the government to help those who have need uh, brother Brian talked about this morning we've talked about the messengers folk there's plenty of people that have need but sometimes so many so many times I fear that a lot of the needs that people have are because of the bad choices that they've made. And even even corporations are bad about this. They go through these bad choices, bad management, and then they want the government to come bail them out by filing bankruptcy or in some other manner. But there's other aspects of this as well. Uh, There is the the societal aspect of this. Uh, Nobody wants to punish people who commit crimes and it's getting worse and worse crime is getting worse and worse because there seems to be no consequences there are even places in our country today where they say that unless unless a a, a crime for example a a robbery or a theft is worth a certain amount we're not even going to prosecute that crime and our society is in my estimation declining more and more because we have no consequences for all of the crime that's being committed in in society but that same thing applies to our spiritual life as well we seem to want to just live any way that we want to live and all the time we hear about somebody who has passed from this life and knowing that that person lived as immoral a life as you could imagine and then his loved ones refer to him as Oh, he's in heaven with God now. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. There are consequences for choices. And when it comes to spiritual consequences, the consequences means missing out on that, on that eternal bliss with our Father. For the prodigal son, we see in verse 17 that it means that he lost everything that he had verse really verse 14 through 17 he lost everything that he had and he reached the point where he wanted to just eat what the hogs were eating i grew up in the country and i grew up on a chicken farm and chickens smell really bad but next 
door to me, a few hundred yards away, was my cousin's hog farm. And I can tell you that the hogs outsmell the chickens any day of the week. There's nothing like you've ever smelled that, that's like a hog pen. Can you imagine wanting to get into that, what we call the hog, the hog tr- the, the slop trough, uh, some of you know what I'm talking about, and eat that food that the hogs eat. That's how desperate this, this fellow was. He lost everything. So the consequences for him was that he had, his father was a wealthy man. and He lost everything. And so verse 17, it says that he came to himself and he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish with hunger? hunger. This brings us to our second point. Everything good that the son had was back home. Now, he, he had some fun for a while. He, he wasted his uh, substance with riotous living, as the old King James says. He had some fun, but then he lost everything. And he recognized that everything that was important to him, everything that was good in his life was back home. As Christians, sometimes we stray away from our God. And we become that prodigal son. And we can, by the way, we can waste our substance in other ways other than living the way this young man did. But we can walk away from God and turn away from Him. And when we come to ourselves, we recognize that all of the blessings that we have as being a part of God's family are in the family. Or when we're with the family of God. James 1 verse 17 says... Every good and every perfect gift is from above. That says a tremendous amount. Every good gift is from above. You Remember when you were a kid and you anticipate Christmas? You anticipate what kind of gift am I going to get? And you've you've told Santa all of, you know, you've given him your list and you've tried to be good and you anticipate all those gifts. This passage says that every good gift is from above, is from God. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing that we have comes from God. But following, but, but remaining in God's family means that it's necessary to maintain our relationship with Him, to follow God's Word. In order to maintain that relationship with Him, we can't just say that we're Christians. We can't just, in fact, we can't just come to church every Sunday. We have to be in God's Word, following His Word. Second John 1, 9, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, get this phrase, does not have God. If we're not abiding in the teaching, we don't have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Sometimes we get the impression that we can make our decision about what we ought to be doing in in terms of religion. And we use that phrase, oh, well, I think, or it seems to me, or in my opinion. And what we ought to be doing is saying, what does the Bible say? What does God's Word say? Because remaining in God's Word is how we remain in that family, how we remain in His family. The world offers us all kinds of of temptations for Christians, both young and old. Uh, Intellectuals will scoff at religion, and when our young people get to college, they're going to be treated as if they're foolish for believing in God, as if if, uh, this is the, the... the, the mentality of the world that if you believe in God, you're, you're just not intelligent at all. Uh, we have temptations to fit into the cool group or the popular crowd. And again, that's not just our young people. That happens at work. That happens when we reach high levels at work. It happens in all aspects of society. And there's a temptation when we get older and we retire from our jobs. There's an awful lot of temptation to retire from God's service as well and to just kind of go into retirement mode. But staying in 
God's word means continuing to serve him and to continuing to follow him throughout all of our life, regardless of what may come. And so the young son gets to that point where he realizes that everything he had is back home. And so he comes up with a plan. In verse 19 or 18, he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll go back to my father and admit what I've done is wrong. I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And, and he says, my, the servants back there have better accommodations than I do. So I'll just go to my father and say, just make me one of your hired servants. That's all I want. Just, just put me, as long as I can just live in your house, I don't care that I don't have everything that I had. Just make me one of your hired servants. And so verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But then get, to, get this. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. God wants to forgive us. Here's one thing that we need to recognize is that notice that the father didn't go out and find his son. He News had probably gotten back to him. We don't really know, but who knows but what the father had found out what, his, what circumstances the son was in. And he knew, even if he didn't know specifically, he knew that things were not going well for his son. Did he get up and go and drag him back home? No. God wants us, when we turn away from him, he wants us to come back to him. He's desirous of having that relationship with us again, but he's not going to go, he's not going to come get us. We have to make that step to come back to him. But when we do, notice what the father did. Notice that the father, the son came up with this big long speech. I've sinned, just make me as one of your higher servants. And then what, how far along did it in his speech did he get? Take note. Verse 21. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he was ready to go on with the rest of the speech. Just make me as one of your higher servants. Father didn't allow him to get to that point. He said, but the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. The image that I get of this father, uh, apparently he's a, he's a, a farmer, a, a rancher or whatever, because it mentions that the son was out in the fields. Think about this father as he's thinking about his son. Every single day he thought about his son, worried about what he's going through, worried about where he is. Can parents relate to this? When our children are off, I had not got there yet because mine's still at home, but when our children go off to college or they move off to another state, we worry about them. I, I, I'm confident that, that even when our children are living at home, when they're, I know that when I was at home and I, if I would be out going to a football game or whatever, my mom never went to sleep until I got home. You know, it didn't matter. She didn't get to sleep until she knew I was safe at home. And that's the image that I get of this father. He's thinking about his son. I can see him out in the field, working in the field, and every once in a while he stops and wipes his brow and looks out on the horizon to see if his son's coming home. He's sitting on the porch at the end of the day, drinking a glass of iced tea, and he looks out to see, is that my son coming home? That's the image that we should have of our father when we've turned away from him is that God is waiting for us to come home. And when we do come home, He doesn't just stick us in the back room. He doesn't stick us off in the servants' quarters, but He completely restores us to full fellowship when we do return to Him. Acts 3.19, Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be, what? Not important anymore, not a big deal. Blotted out, wiped away. Whiteout is used on the sheet of paper, and it's no longer there. Joel 2.13, I love this passage. And rend your hearts and not your garments. You remember a lot of times in the Bible you hear about people tearing their clothes. This is an expression of, of great grief. He says, don't tear your clothes, rend your heart, and turn to the Lord. Why? For He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. God wants to forgive us of what we have done when we sin. And I think that it's significant, as I said, that the father didn't even let him finish his speech. Instead, he turned 
turned to the servants and said, put him back in the position that he was in. Returning to God, though, requires more than just walking back in. It requires confessing our sins. John 1.9 says, says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there are requirements within God's word that we, if we are a wayward Christian, if we've turned away from God, if we've wasted our substance with righteous living, that we do need to come back to the church, but not just come back in and start sitting in the pew again. We actually have to make confession of our faith. And sometimes if that sin is of a public nature, then it, that confession needs to be of a public nature as well so that everyone knows that you have confessed and repented of that sin and asked God for forgiveness for that sin. And then that brings us to our fourth point, and this is that last part of the story where the other son got jealous. I heard a sermon, or I've heard a sermon a couple of times on the prodigal son's brother and about how we as Christians should, should or should not react when we see someone that has gone astray. Notice in verse 25 that the older son was out in the field and he came back and he heard, heard the partying going on and the celebration. And he went to a servant and said, what's going on? And the servant said, well, your brother's returned home. And the, and the older brother refused to go in because he was jealous. And he said to the father, and, and this is a, a typical thought process that, that we probably would go through. It, it, is this a surprising reaction on the brother's part? Not really. Put yourself in that place. You know, I, I've been doing the right thing all this time, and you're... Your son, you know, this, my brother went out and, and, and wasted substance, and he comes back, and now he's the life of the party? He says to his father in verse 27, the, the, so the father, uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, uh, verse 28, he was angry and refused to go in, and, but the father came out and entreated him. And verse 20, 29 says, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I never disobeyed you, your command Yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. And then notice he says, but this son of yours, he didn't say my brother. He said, this son of yours has come back after he's devoured your property with prostitutes and you killed a fatted calf for him. Is that the way we would likely react? Probably. That's, that's a common reaction. But the father said, son, you're always with me. And all that you have is my, all that, all that I have is yours. He says, I appreciate your faithfulness. God respects our, our, those of us who remain faithful. He appreciates our faithfulness. But he wants us to celebrate when those who have turned away come back. It says Luke 15, verse 7, I tell you that in the same way that there will be more joy in heaven. This is the earlier passage, the story of the, of the, uh, the lost coin, that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Well, is there joy over righteous people that need no repentance? Well, yes, obviously there is. God appreciates our faithfulness. He loves us for our faithfulness. But the point of the story is that there is great joy and there should be great joy when someone who is a wayward sinner turns away. Psalms 35, 9, and my soul shall rejoice in the Lord, it shall exult in his salvation. There should be rejoicing. And, and the Father is saying, and God says to us, that when one of our brothers falls away and comes back, we need to be happy. We need to be celebrating. Do we have a tendency to sort of put that person in a, in a separate category for a while? When somebody has been completely unfaithful, not even been come to church, and then they come back and they come forward... And they confess their sins. You know, in the back of our mind, do we sometimes say, well, let's see how it goes. You know, is that, is that common? I think we probably do without even really recognizing it. But what God is saying is be fully rejoicing, fully happy that that person has come back. And assume the best. Assume that he's going to be, going to be faithful. God is telling us that, that God tells us that our faithfulness will be rewarded. Blessed is James 1, 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Again, 
not in any way saying that God doesn't love those who are faithful and those who live that faithful life. But he's saying that when we do have someone who has fallen away, turned away, then we should be rejoicing when they come back. Now, as I mentioned, wasting our substance with riotous living, or as it said here in the version that I read, uh, he squandered his property with reckless living. And then as his brother referenced, he wasted your property with prostitutes. We don't have to go to that extreme to find ourselves away from God or to be a, product, a prodigal son or a prodigal child. We can waste what God has given us just by, just by turning away, just by saying, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Or we could be a prodigal. This is something uh, that we need to, to think about very uh, seriously. A prodigal son can be sitting right in this audience every, su every Sunday. Do you agree with that? Just because we're sitting in the pew, just because we're here, doesn't mean that we haven't turned our back on God. And I, I'm, I'm confident that there are probably people in every church who have turned away from God and, yet, and, and are prodigal. They're waste, they've wasted what God has given them because they're not fully embracing everything that God has done for us. And they are in need of turning back to God. And if we do that, then God will accept us back with great joy. And at the end of each sermon, we offer the invitation for those who are not Christians, who have never been baptized into Christ. And if you're not a child of God, we, we would like to see you obey God's word today and become a child of God. But sometimes we don't focus on the fact that they're are people who are needing to be restored to God's fellowship by coming back, coming forward and confessing your sins and being restored into that full fellowship just as the prodigal son was. So if you're here today and you're subject to the gospel in either one of these two ways, then we invite you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song together.